Hey, yo, all right, man, look, I want to talk about the biggest hidden secrets in lore from Breath of the Wild that the sequel may shed some light on. Because let's face it, Breath of the Wild is a modern day classic, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't leave some loose ends untied. I mean, if the story wrapped up real clean with a pretty little bow on top, there wouldn't be a sequel in production, right? So this is my list of the five most interesting mysteries from Breath of the Wild I'd love to see addressed in the sequel. Number five. How the Zora and the Rito are able to coexist. This one is number 5 because it's an interesting thought but I really don't see it being discussed at all whatsoever. Basically, the Rito evolved from the Zora. They came out of the water, onto dry land, and turned to birds. Now look, I'm no evolutionary biologist, my degree doesn't even focus on the sciences, obviously. But for me, 10,000 years just didn't seem like enough time for a species to evolve from ocean to land, let alone take flight. So I consulted the internet and it says it takes about a million years, which seems more reasonable. And that aside, typically what you see when a species evolves is that the version 2.0 lives on and version 1.0 dies out. Shout out to all the Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons out there. But hey, don't forget about the evil version of the Zora that we see predominantly in the earlier games from the Fallen Hero timeline. Evolving from that species of fish instead of benevolent Zora could explain the Rito's coexistence, and it would also explain why some of the Rito in Breath of the Wild are kind of abrasive, aggressive, and standoffish on first encounter. And that's just the nice way of putting it. <laughs> Number 4. How deep might the Gerudo Origins rabbit hole go? The main thing we know about Ganondorf is that he was the last male to be born among the Gerudo and that he was so bad that he messed it up for all Hyrulean dudes for practically the rest of eternity. Talk about a cock block. But what happened after all that? What happened to all the men that were living at that time? Were they rejected, shunned, and banished until they all died off naturally? Or were they witch hunted and killed off? And if Gerudo women are celibate, how are there even any of them around still 10,000 years later? If they can mate with other races like Hylians and whatnot, what do they do with their male-born children? But the darkest thing I've seen come up in Zelda circles as far as the Gerudo go is this idea that Riju could be a direct descendant of Ganondorf, her great 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 you know however great he is grandfather or whatever. This theory is entertained by the way she's sitting on her throne when we first come to see her. It's similar but not the exact same position that Ganondorf sits upon his throne in Twilight Princess. Some people say, oh my god, shut up, you're so reaching right now, and that's totally fair. Other people understand the deep usage of symbolism and believe that every animation is done with intention. Yes, yeah, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, definitely, but it's plausible that when the current leader of the Gerudo is animated to sit in her place of power, the same way that the King of Thieves turned Demon King once sat upon his throne, well, Nintendo might have done that with intention, and if so, the sequel would assumably dive pretty deep on that one. Ganondorf is definitely a feature in this upcoming story, so it's possible that we'll see some of his past as well. But whether they're related or not, Riju might find herself struggling with something as the plot thickens. I hope she doesn't go all Anakin Skywalker on us. But now that's what you call reaching. Number 3. How Things Stand with the Yiga Clan now, I'm curious about them because it's been leaked somewhere that at the beginning of the game we'll see Link and Zelda dealing with some sort of threat, challenge, or antagonist that's not directly Ganondorf. And if it's not a new enemy or group altogether, could we see some more impressive Yiga action? All we really know about the Yiga is that they formed about 10,000 years before Breath of the Wild. Back then the Sheikah had been developing highly advanced technology and Hyrule was flourishing. And that's when they built the Guardians and the Divine Beasts among other things in preparation for Ganon's return. And when he did appear, the then-present reincarnations of Zelda and Link sealed them away with the support of those guardians and divine beasts. But that success made the King of Hyrule at the time paranoid of a potential power overthrow. So to prevent a possible coup d'etat, he ordered the divine beast to be buried underground in locations across Hyrule, causing a radical faction of the Sheikah to split off, swear their allegiance to Ganon, and form the Yiga clan. So then, with the Sheikah scattered all across Hyrule, many of them abandoned their technology work, and the civilization in Hyrule declined to a kind a primitive state over the following 10 millennia. During this time, the Sheikah eventually settled into Kakariko Village and were no longer banished by the royal family. So what's been the Yiga's motivation most of the time in there? Waiting around 10,000 years for your buddy to show up as dedication. What point is there for them to continue at the start of the sequel when everyone thinks Ganon is freshly sealed away for another 10,000 years? Like, come on dudes, you guy lost twice now. You can go back to a normal life if you just go back and reconcile with the Sheikah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> How will these guys be involved once Ganondorf is out there getting lit again? 
And why do they love bananas so much? What's up with that? I don't, you know what? I digress. Number two, the Zonai tribe. Let's just get them out of the way right now. I know the disappearance of the Zonai is cited as one of the biggest mysteries in all of Hyrule, but let's keep it a buck. Before the sequel trailer, they were barely even given a second look, let alone a first by most players, myself included. But once their ruins were spotted in the trailer, they moved right into the spotlight. In fact, my next Zelda video is going to dive deep into the question as to whether or not these guys were good guys or bad guys. There are clues to support both theories, and when it's published, I'll link it here and in the description. Suffice it for now to say that they were a seemingly primitive tribe of savages who had powerful magical abilities and who mysteriously just whoosh, disappeared. They lived in the Faron region, but show evidence of making it all over the map, just like the Sheikah. They wore clothing we know as the Barbarian Armor Set, and the Lurlin village residents may very well be their descendants. But if the Zonai just vanished all of a sudden like and whatnot, I don't see how that would work. If they all mysteriously disappeared, how would there be any of them left to even have descendants 10,000 years later? You know what I'm saying? Anyway, last but definitely not least, and number one, what happened to Zelda's mother? We know she passed away when Zelda was young, but we don't know when or how, or maybe most importantly, why. She was supposed to teach Zelda how to use her magic sealing powers, and something tragic happened before she was able to. It could have been an accident, or she could have been killed by the Yiga clan for all we know. Either way, Breath of the Wild arguably gave us more of a story focused on Zelda than any other legend of her title before it and we're only going to get more of her story in the sequel. And whatever happened to her mother definitely played a pivotal role in the character she's played out to be so far. The self-doubt, the frustrations, the weaknesses, and the strengths. And of course, it's led to the events of the whole entire story in general. Had Zelda's mother lived to teach her how to control her powers on command, Calamity Ganon would have gone down like the chump that he is in the first round. Easy work. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on it. Leave yours in the comments. Did I miss anything interesting or get something wrong? I want to know. Of course, please like and share the video if you got something out of it. Subscribe if you're new or if you haven't already and you want to stay current. Hit the bell to catch things first. It's all free. It supports the channel so much I can't even explain. It's absolutely insane and you can always change your mind later if you want to. It's like the best deal of all time. You can't beat it. <laughs> There's no way. But anyway, thank you so very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And in a way, it really does mean the world to me. So until next time, stay well, stay cool, and always keep punching out there. Aloha.